que una región próspera es posible. Hacer frente a la crisis climática ofrece una oportunidad de desarrollo sostenible, superación de la pobreza y de crecimiento económico. La transición puede aportar un 1% de crecimiento adicional del PIB al 2030. Estamos reunidos aquí por nuestro compromiso con el impulso de la acción climática en América Latina y el Caribe. I want to tell you about something that is very important for me for all of us, really. It's something we need to play, to dance, to dream. Without it, our lives are very difficult, and sometimes we don't have it at all. That Good morning, and welcome to this second day of seminars. I'm Caroline Schmidt, and along with my colleague Jose Bravo, will be with you today. Warm greetings as well to all those following through the broadcast for this fourth seminar on building bridges to boost food security and sustainable energy as part of the annual meeting of the boards of governors of the IDB and IDB Invest. That's right. At this seminar, we'll be exploring ways to boost um, production and uh, agricultural trade in a sustainable and inclusive way, in addition to looking at ways to transition towards cleaner energies. So let us start with our first panel dealing with agri-food systems and how they can aid trade, economic development, and the development of jobs as well as help reduce poverty and enhance food security. And to kick off our seminar, we are honored to have two visionary leaders. Of course, we'll be joined by James Scriven and uh, Irene Arias Hoffman, the CEO of IDB Invest and the CEO of IDB Lab. So let's put our hands together for them and a warm welcome to all of you. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure and honor to be with all of you. We'd like to thank the organizers and the people of Panama for the warm welcome. 
This is an opportunity for Eden and myself to talk about two important topics, two topics that are important and urgent. One is food security and the other one is climate change. Both of them are pressing issues and necessities for the region. The first one, food security. As you know, we are one of the world's regions that produces and exports the most uh, food, grain, and uh, other products. But on the way out of the pandemic, with the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war, the effect has been devastating for prices and food security in our region. So I would like to start by sharing some data with you to reflect the vulnerabilities. First, for many of the countries in our region, smaller countries that don't produce as much and need to import, the price of food imports has increased significantly. And secondly, for countries that are large food producers, many of the inputs they import have seen an increase in prices, in particular fertilizers. So these two elements have had a significant impact on our region, but particularly with regard to the vulnerable populations. And we'll have a panel dealing with that. Precisely. And the second topic is climate change. As we all know, as a region, we have been able to transform or increase our use of renewable energies. Over the past 10 years, we have increased by 33 percent the share of renewables in our region. But population growth in a region which will significantly increase means that we are lagging behind in order to achieve such levels. So these are two important topics, both for the region and for the IDB group. I would like to talk to you a bit more about that. Thanks, James. Indeed, the picture you presented stresses why at the IDB group we are prioritizing food security and the decarbonization of the economy, and why we're also working in an integrated fashion to meet the sustainable development goals, and uh, particularly also working as regards zero hunger and uh, climate change, um, seeking to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goals, which emphasize the importance and urgency when it comes to harnessing innovation to come up with a much more effective response to these challenges, which otherwise won't go away. So I will make a few remarks from the angle of innovation, which is the focus of IDB Lab. As a region, we have a huge opportunity in this regard. Innovation is not easy, and there are challenges in order for it to be effective in this field. From the point of view of financing, we see three challenges. One is that there is no pipeline. There aren't enough mature projects yet that do deliver an effective response in this area. We still need to flesh out the pipeline. So along with other partners, we are developing responses such as the Green Hub, an initiative which brings together private, public, philanthropic, and climate capital to accelerate. It's a sort of sandbox, an incubator and accelerator for projects that can have an impact in terms of environmental sustainability and uh, also as regards climate while tackling the food security challenge. The second challenge linked to finance is the fact that even where the pipeline is there, there's still a lot of friction or inefficiencies as to how the financiers seeking the projects can get to find them. So we are working for the Amazon region as part of a collaborative partnership, EcoInvest, to facilitate a lot more the matchmaking between supply and demand, with a particular focus on bioeconomic solutions, eco-entrepreneurs trying to find ways to harness the natural capital of the Amazon while enhancing environmental conservation. So once we have this much 
mm, smoother connection, uh, the projects start to grow. And then comes the third pillar, the finance. After the first two uh, phases, the financing is still lacking. And I mean startups which are springing up around the world, but when they are uh, well into the early stages, they face other difficulties. And this is why we have such solutions as equity for development, a conversion vehicle, as part of which we've invited third parties for them to be able to benefit from our ability to originate investment opportunities, offering also a chance to um, work with us as part of investors. But it's not all about finance. We also need to tackle the capacity side of things and uh, there's a need specifically to foster more rapid growth without reinventing the wheel, without duplicating efforts across regions while fostering joint ventures or exchanges, bringing together innovation from different parts of the world. And we've seen this at work in the region. Umitron, a Japanese company, is present in Peru working on the productivity of small holder farmers. We've seen an Israeli company, Suplan, working in Paraguay, also with small-scale farmers to enhance uh, irrigation systems and make them more efficient, which may bring more effectiveness and accelerate the scalability so that this is not just about small-scale pilots. And here there's the continuum between IDB Lab and IDB Invest, because you get to the scalability and growth level and can then join efforts in order for the financing to continue through IDB Invest. And as these ideas continue to expand and develop, we ourselves evolve as a group. And I wanted to share with you three pillars that will prove important as part of the evolution of the IDB uh, private sector. First, it's about truly raising our ambition level. Today, we have indicators that are highly decentralized, and we want to be a key focus, as our president said yesterday during the session, when it comes to the climate, social, physical, and digital infrastructure agendas. In other words, increasing our focus and being laser thin in terms of our focus. That's the first thing. The second point is that today we are limited in terms of the products that we can offer as a group. So we need to expand our uh, technical advisory capacity and also with regard to venture capital investments. So that's the second point. And the third point, and probably the most important one, is how we act as a group. As a group, we have the capacity to help countries and the private sector to solve and uh, resolve development uh, issues. So when you connect the focus, product expansion, and when we work as a group, we feel we have great chances to help all of our countries and clients. So we have already seen a few exercises. The NG uh, example in Chile is one working with government and private sector on decarbonization. Other great examples have to do with large uh, food producers in Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay. We've had several good examples which will be uh, elaborated on as part of the next panel. Thank you, James. As you see, this is a whole group sort of thing working with IDB Invest and IDB Lab alongside the private sector with a commitment to continue working to address the food security challenge as well as to deal with the climate crisis. Certainly, during the panels, you will see this at work, so do enjoy that. Thanks very much, and we'll stay in touch. Well, thanks very much to our two leaders for this introduction. We are now ready for our first panel and will now welcome our specialists with a big round of applause.
Vanessa. Sí. Adelante, vamos adelante. Gracias. Allá nos sentamos. Miren, una pregunta. Si me da... Nos sentamos ahí. Ah, ok, perfecto. Muy bien. Comenzamos ya entonces. Buenos días. So we can get started. Good morning and welcome to the panel on production and trade to boost food security. We face an unprecedented crisis in terms of food security with the increase in the prices of agricultural inputs, fertilizers and oil in addition to the volatility in the uh, food supply which has led to disruptions in volumes and to higher prices. At the IDB Group, we have long been working to deal with these issues with our public sector colleagues and also through IDB um, Invest and IDB Lab with the private sector. At IDB Invest, we have increased our sustainable financing capacity for working capital, the largest source of demand during the last couple of years in this field. And uh, at IDB Lab, we've been working to apply technological innovations for the sake of sustainable agricultural production. Recent studies show that in our region, the share of the population suffering from food insecurity has risen from 32% in 2019 to 41% in 2021. And f uh, severe food insecurity has risen from 10% to 15% in the last uh, few years. We are talking about 30 to 35 million people in our region who during the last three years have seen uh, severe growth in food insecurity. The magnitude of the crisis is such that it requires joint interventions both on the public and private sector fronts. This is why we have invited to this panel representatives from both sectors to discuss the topic of food insecurity through both uh, lenses, seeking common work methods with a view to finding solutions. We'll kick off the panel with a question for um, Mario Lubetkin from FAO. He is the uh, regional uh, representative and director general for Latin America and the Caribbean. FAO has recently published a report on food security and nutrition in Latin America and the Caribbean, looking at the details with regard to increased figures of hunger and malnutrition in addition to the structural problems that the region faces. Could you perhaps provide an overview as to the food insecurity situation in the region and what the differences are you see at FAO between the different countries? Yes, thank you, Aitor. Yes, indeed. I think you... Uh, uh, gave us a preview of the figures. The uh, annual report figures, uh, both regional and global, point to a clearly negative trend. Globally, we are talking about 828 million people who uh, go hungry every year. And we're talking about uh, 3,000 um, or 3, 3 or 3.1 million people who don't get the right food. It's not just about eating, but about eating right. Otherwise, the problem increases. And in Latin America, we see that currently about 56 million people are suffering from hunger and some 268 million suffer some form of food insecurity, which accounts for 40% of the population, according to our data. Certainly, it is a trend that is on the increase due to natural factors. Uh, you know, uh, well, there's the economic crisis to the COVID, the war. And if you look at the results for the last year, we have seen an increase in 30% when it comes to hunger. And the most remarkable point is that our data continues to show that Latin America and the Caribbean 
can produce food for 1.3 billion people, almost twice the population we have in the region. And still, we have these results. And uh, according to a recent ECLAC report, we may be looking at 200 million people facing poverty. As you rightly pointed out, and as the IDB colleagues who uh, spoke before noted, we are optimistic in our action and uh, work with governments. We uh, think it's great to have this discussion with a view to combining public and private capacities, because we are fully convinced that no one by themselves will be able to deal with all of this. It's only through the combination of all capacities, governments, the private sector, civil society, academia, and of course with innovation matters that we will be uh, doing a deep dive into, and well, with the Minister of Honduras as well. We, we are seeing all of this. This is a concrete reality in many countries in Latin America. Our feeling uh, and our sensibilities have to do with the whole region. Um, but we have a particular focus on the hardest hit regions, such as Central America and the Caribbean countries. Recently, in a conversation with the Caribbean ministers, they talked about a fundamental strategic program to reduce by 25 percent the uh, imports. They have a focus on tourism. And there are many challenges in Latin America that we can only deal with together. Thanks, Mario. You talked about the Secretary of Agriculture of the uh, government of Honduras, uh, Lara Suazo. You've been working very hard, Mrs. Suazo, in Honduras to enhance productivity in the agricultural sector while enhancing food security in the country. Some of these uh, policies are very long term, so they go well beyond a single administration. Could you tell us what these policies for the agriculture sector are about? Yes, certainly. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak on a panel that discusses such important topics, such as food security, first and foremost. The Honduran experience reflects the experience of a country that can't escape the global context. When you brought up the issue, you mentioned climate change, for instance, as well as other global matters that have an impact on all of our countries, the price of inputs, the price of fertilizers. All of that has a global impact. And imagine uh, if it has an impact on high income countries, the, the increase in prices and the increase in end products. Well, all the more so in the case of low-income countries. And I need to make this brief comment before responding to your question, because a state policy, as is the case with Honduras, is also subject to the impact of global policies, which also have an impact. And another important thing when designing public policy is your own contextual history. Food security is a long-term issue. For years, we've been trying to find that magical formula so that countries like ours can achieve food security, and yet that hasn't materialized. And the other thing is that in order to define a policy for the agri-food sector, a foundation for planning and strategic planning requires that we find ways to end poverty. Because in a country where seven out of 10 people live in poverty, it's truly difficult to come up with public policies which in the short term will achieve the expected results, such as is the case with food security. In our case, we have worked for some six months as part of a true marathon racing along with the main stakeholders and actors in the main food chains of uh, Honduras, trying to look at the current situation, looking at their dreams, where they want to be, and also looking at their constraints. And after analyzing all of this national context, we found that all change face very similar constraints. And many of the responses depend on decisions by the state, by government, but others depend on the connections and interrelations and partnerships with both private banking and public banking, research centers globally, and of course at the regional level, academic centers, for instance. 
And this also has to do with models that will enable technology transfers. Another key element has to do with the institutionality of the public sector. And in our case, it's about rebuilding trust at the Secretary's Office for Agriculture and Livestock. It's about enhancing reliability, transparency, and efficiency. But it's also about governance in the partnerships between institutions, groups, farmers groups, businesses in the sector, with a view to ensuring that when a farmer comes along and wants to buy a bag of fertilizer and that costs three times more than uh, he would pay if he bought on a bug basis, well, that side of governance is one area we should focus on to improve. And then there's a few other topics that are extremely important in order to have a positive impact in the short run. And it seems to me that Honduras has a very favorable climate, even though we are vulnerable to climate change, but our climate makes it possible for us to grow many different crops that are currently not being grown and these can be used to this can be sold to other countries who are willing and able to pay but we need to address production issues but to do that we need investment capital we could borrow and as a country and as producers and yet if we don't have support when it comes to marketing if we don't have secure market outlets, even if we have a wide range of pricing, productive activity is not going to be able to produce results. And that is something that is extremely important and should be considered as part of public policies. And the last thing is um, innovation in agrologistics. As a country, we cannot continue to dream of high competitiveness indicators when the country needs to continue to borrow in order to digitize, extend um, power coverage, and do other things. Sometimes it's just having additional capacity in order to compete in other markets and generate income that can then be reinvested to secure our food security. So that is, in broad terms, what that policy needs to include. And one of the reasons why we are not better off than we are is because we don't have a visionary and strategic public policy that spells out what is needed in order to have solid investments in the short and medium term. And that also indicates the expected results. Then there's also return on investment, which is something that has not been contemplated as part of policy thus far. Those are excellent points. And when it comes to policy association and how to bring in the producer in order to have more efficient production means and to increase production volumes. Let's now turn to the private sector, starting with Rosario Bassan, CEO and founder of Damper, an exporting company in the fruit um, producing sector. Damper has been promoting a more efficient and also more inclusive food supply chain. I'd like to ask you, how has the food industry and agricultural industry empowered women in Peru and boosted food security. Well, first of all, let me thank the IDB for offering me the opportunity to be here at this very important event to share information and also learn. The food and agriculture sector in Latin America plays a key role in ensuring the food security of our region and also in supporting food security around the world. It also contributes significantly to inclusive growth and the consequent reduction of structural poverty in our countries. Despite the many obstacles and pain points we have in the countries, Latin America and the Caribbean have become 
the number one exporting region for foods globally. And this has been possible because we have known how to position our products in the leading markets around the world by upholding top quality standards and mainly for products known as superfoods like avocado, blueberries, mango, asparagus, and others, just to mention a few. And yet, our region also needs to face a very crude and difficult reality, and it is that 32% of our population lives in poverty. So 200 million people lack access to basic services needed for human development. And in my own country, Peru, we have a 30% poverty level, which means that 10 million people in my country live in poverty. And this situation can be found in the majority of countries. It jeopardizes our population, their stability, and also our development. So that's why I find that business leaders and public sector leaders are called upon to help generate conditions for development as well as opportunities that will help reduce food insecurity and poverty, structural poverty. Given this situation, the food and agriculture sector in Peru has become the driver for decentralized development, and it is the main source of formal jobs. It provides jobs to 26% of the economically active population and has contributed to reducing structural poverty from 60% in 2000 to about 30% currently. Given this, the company I head, Danper, since its inception, has had a business model based on generating shared value. It connects profitability and progress for our company with that of our employees and their families and communities. These initiatives promote development, and one program which does this is Predica, which provides good quality jobs to women and also young men by providing them ongoing training. This makes them more productive. It also provides them with access to a better economic income. So they and their families are, are better off. It makes them more competitive and also makes our company more competitive. We also have data from the OCD, which tells us that women invest more than 30% of their income in education and food and nutrition for their children. Let me repeat that. That is in providing nutrition, health, and education for their children. That is why our company, Damper, offers development opportunities to our women by providing them with ongoing training, also taking care of their health in our facilities, offering them options to complete their primary and secondary education without having to stop working, and making sure that they have a safe and fair place to work. This is how we empower our women. This is what enables them to become agents of change, to have control over their own destiny, thereby guaranteeing not only their food security, but that of their families, and to contribute to the food security of all countries around the world. I am convinced that empowering women and that gender equity are essential factors if we're going to achieve economic growth and social development. This is how I believe that we can ensure the sustainable development of our countries. 
let me thank the IDB for being a strategic partner in furthering the strategic development of our company and also of the food and agriculture sector in Peru. I'm also grateful to the IDB for having been at our side, for having guided us in achieving our EDGE certification. And it's the only certification in gender equity which has global evaluation standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosario. It's very important to empower women, and you do that very well in Damper. You've been doing it for many years, and now you've been applying it in the context of food safety, security initiatives. Still with the private sector, Fatima Pereira, who's the director for sustainability at Multinversiones, which is a Central American company in the food and agricultural sector. The FMI, Fatima, is a, an example of how the private sector has been able to promote innovation throughout the food supply chain. What is the role of the food industry in ensuring food security from the standpoint of innovation? Thank you. I think that our role really has been part, being part of the solution. What does this mean? As a food industry member, we have a responsibility to produce quality foods that provide adequate nutrition for our people in sufficient amounts. That foods have to be varied because consumers are entitled to have access to different foods and they have to be accessible. And by accessible, I mean from a geographic standpoint. All our communities, even the most vulnerable, should have access, but it also means being accessible from a pricing standpoint. I think that the important question becomes, how do you do this? You do this with investment, innovation, and with agility or nimbleness. It's uh, the past two years from a food security standpoint have been unprecedented, multiple challenges stemming from the pandemic, from the war, and from <clears throat> the lack of products in the food supply. But Multinversiones last year announced an investment of $1.8 billion in Central America and the Caribbean, of which $1 million will be to ensure food security. It's only if we continue to believe and invest in our productive apparatus to expand capacity, that's the only way for us to truly address food security. So it's innovation and investing in products and in making our processes more effective to support digital platforms that can connect us with the consumers, innovation when it comes to logistics, and then nimbleness. We need to be flexible to address different types of situations. And this means that we need to be very disciplined. We need to control expenditures. We must also have rigor when it comes to our raw materials. We must also be able to connect with non-traditional markets. And we do that when we buy grains, also buying inputs in advance to avoid any interruptions in the supply chain that would jeopardize food security. So we do believe that the role of private companies and the food industry, given that we don't do this alone, we work with other partners, is to become a part of the solution by investing, being flexible, and also by innovating. Thank you, Fatima. Minister Suasso mentioned it. There's no innovation without investment. So that is where the private sector comes in. And you've made that very clear. Let's go back to the public sector. And I will ask Vice Minister Schall a question. She represents the government of Belize. Where smallholders are relevant in the agricultural value chains in the country, how does the government work with the private sector to integrate these smallholders into the value chains and improve their productivity levels. But also, not only the producti productivity levels uh, of them, but also their individual food security. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. 
It's a pleasure to be here to represent the government of Belize and the people of Belize. Uh, I want to thank the Inter-American Development Bank for this opportunity to address this gathering today. Um, agriculture is a very important a part of Belize's economy. It is one of the two main pillars of our economy. We have agriculture and tourism. Agriculture makes up about, agriculture production makes up about 14% of our national GDP and accounts for about 17% of um, employment in the economy. Uh, much of the agriculture <clears throat> that we have is uh, due to our his to, uh, history as a colony and we export um, a lot of commodities, um, which makes up about 80% of the exports of the country. Uh, but because of this, um, the, the, the exports are, are very limited to citrus, sugar, and bananas. And we end up still importing about $220 million worth of food products into the country every year. Nonetheless, um, Belize is one of the most food secure countries in Central America, but also in the Caribbean. We consume, um, of all the food we consume, 60% of it is produced in, in the country and in Belize. You know? um, so some of the things we're doing in Belize is we're, tr we're diversifying from the traditional commodities into new uh, higher value agricultural products. And in this, way we are um, bringing in new actors and new players into the agriculture sector, working with small farmers. Um, we're also looking at um, uh, the, the hurdles that agribusiness and small farmers face in agriculture production. And one of the things that we are doing is looking at the policies of the government that sometimes act as a barrier or hurdle to this uh, development. And so we have been uh, removing some of the tariffs and taxes on inputs um, for agricultural producers. We are entirely dependent on um, the private sector for agricultural production in Belize. And so to expand the integration of all players into the entire supply chain and the value chain, we have no choice but to work directly with uh, the private sector as our partners. Uh, we believe in the, in the capacity of the private sector for innovation and growth and to, to, to drive the change that we need to diversify the economy, but also in the process ensure food security for the country. Um, we maintain very close relationship with agribusiness Whenever they have a problem or an issue, they bring it to us as the government, and we try to be as responsive as possible, and respond also as quickly as possible. For instance, uh, recently, uh, agribusinesses came to the government and said a lot of the inputs that we use, that we're trying to use to move up the value chain are being taxed uh, too high, and uh, it's creating a problem because the end product then becomes very expensive to put on the market and it's not competitive. And so what we did was remove those duties and taxes on those so that they can have a competitive product, finished product, to, they can put on the shelves. Um, we're also providing uh, fiscal incentives for smaller producers, um, especially for enterprises that are led by women and youth um, and small farmers. Uh, in the past, fiscal incentives were reserved only for large businesses and large investors. But if it's good for large businesses and large investors, it's also good for the small, small producers and small businesses. And so uh, we have also uh, now developed a, a fresh package of incentives for small businesses so that they can begin to participate in the supply chain in agricultural production. But beyond that, we have also um, a, removed all forms of taxation on small businesses for the first three years of their life so that they can grow. Uh, it doesn't make sense to begin taxing them as they register their company. You, you let them grow. Uh, you allow them a chance and space um, to innovate, to, to produce, to become profitable, 
before you begin to think of, of taxing them. And so that's, those are some of the, the things that we're doing. Of course, the government has a very important role to play. Um, some of the other things that we're doing is ensuring that there is a, the right infrastructure, both in terms of energy and roads and, 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 and markets um, for agro-producers. Um, and we're also encouraging and promoting the, the integration of technology in, in agriculture production as well. So there's a, there's a long road ahead, but we're very optimistic. We're very hopeful about the future. We have seen the effects and the beneficial effects that our policies have had on agriculture production. We have increased our exports. We have begun to see the diversification happening in the local market. And um, all of this has resulted in ensuring that we are able to feed ourselves as a country. As a matter of fact, we were able to weather the storm of COVID because we were able to produce our own food and consume our own food. Uh, and so uh, this is just a few of the experiences that we have had in Belize. And we continue to work. We have a clear plan with the government and the Ministry of Economic Development and Agriculture. And we uh, constantly review these plans to see where changes need to be made. It is important that the government facilitate the growth of business, especially agribusiness, and to do everything possible to ensure that um, it provides jobs and employment, it provides uh, foreign currency for the country through exports, and it provides income, especially for rural families, and in this way, address the issue of poverty as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Minister. Uh, claro ejemplo. This is a very clear example of how the public sector cannot do it alone, nor can the private sector, so it's important for them to communicate and to set up mechanisms and platforms to engage in that discussion and find solutions. On the panel, we also have Clivio Marshall, who is the finance director of the LAR Group. It is an um, Brazilian cooperative which also works in the southern cone. We've been hearing about smaller from small countries and now we turn to a large countries over the past 30 years. Brazil from an agro-food standpoint has grown so much that it's now one of the leading food producers in the world and that has been achieved by both public and private sector initiatives. What do you think is the factor that accounts for your country's leading role in this area? Thank you, Aitor, and thank you to the IDB for the invitation. I'm here today representing our firm and also our country, Brazil. You said it quite well, Brazil has become one of the leading food producers in the hemisphere. Over the past 40 years, we went from being importers to being food exporters. From 1975 to 2017, our production went from 46 to 312 billion tons per year. This is striking because this is a six-fold increase compared to where we were in 1975. But our food production area went from 29 to 68 million hectares, which means that the area grew at a rate of th or 3.2 times. So our production increased six-fold and yet the area used for production only increased by 3.2 times. So we believe that this spectacular growth is due to one factor, and it is a stronger role by science and technology. In 1973, we created Embrapa, which is the Brazilian company for agricultural research. It invests as 
a public sector agency, but it also supports companies in the private sector so that they can produce more using technology, partnering with researchers. And we set up Embrapa officers for, so uh, for soy, corn, and other products. We also focused on family agriculture, offering families subsidized credit. And that also had an impact on sustainability. So technology, productivity, more production, less land for production, and sustainability. So Embrapa also developed a technology to grow directly to motel, and this helped us to develop larger markets. 7.6% of our territory is used for agricultural purposes. So, I thought we believe that we do have the right conditions. And after listening to panelists from other countries, I would say that technology and innovation, as you said, are key factors. These are incentives for small units to produce sustainably and also for larger landholders with public investment, but also with a clear objective, which is to step up productivity in a manner that is sustainable. Thank you, Clerio. This is yet another example of how the public sector in Brazil several decades ago had a vision and established Embrapa with the purpose of providing technological support to develop agricultural platforms. And the private sector was on board with the initiative and used those platforms in order to produce more and more sustainably. The second part of the title of this panel relates with trade. And I will turn or focus my next question on that. This is one thing which organizations have discussed with governments. They've been encouraging governments not to adopt protectionist measures. How do you maintain a steady food supply? What measures are being used across the region? Well, first of all, we have been listening to comments by other speakers. And what I would say is that for FAO, thinking of future sustainability, what is important is overhauling our agri-food systems. What this means is to do what our public sector colleagues and our private sector colleagues have described. It is important to find a formula for a sustainable solution which is respectful of the environment. We also need to have financing, to have markets, to have transparency, transportation, and technology. So this is a package which we call transformation of agri-food systems. Uh, that are, uh, to achieve this transformation, I think all of this needs to be in place. But we start with a point made by a previous panelist. Right now, to give you numbers, we have annually 41.6% of production in Latin America and the Caribbean is exported, which means an agri-food surplus of $174 million per year. So we are not starting off from a negative position, not at all. I'd like to focus on two things. You spoke of a multilateral approach, and this is something that became important in the final post-COVID stage. We have a long list of elements to help governments, but I would only mention three. First, guaranteeing access and mobility in the transportation sector it was one of the major issues, and it's still there. Also, guaranteeing ports 
and access to ports, and this is not just in the context of Ukraine, and then also avoiding any restrictive measures on exports and imports which could curtail regional and international trade. These were the measures that were put in place when we're looking at emergency context and also at the current situation. We play a leading role when it comes to guaranteeing or striving to guarantee agricultural security and sustainability. And I can summarize it in a number of points. We support governments in order to keep the trade in foods and fertilizers open, reducing restrictive measures internationally, and bolstering intra-regional trade. Secondly, and these are not ranked in order, improving transparency. This is essential for markets and for the public and private sectors, avoiding speculation by making use of all the tools and digital platforms available to ensure transparency and access to information. The IDB has developed outstanding instruments, which I think are very useful. Also maintaining the purchasing power of the most vulnerable through cash and in-kind transfers, as the poorest segments need to have an active role as part of the process. Also supporting family-based agriculture, as um, indicated by a Brazilian colleague, and artisanal fisheries to produce nutritional value products and also for uh, territory management. We focus on smallholder farmers, on family-based production, and on fisheries production, because that is the line between production and poverty. It's 80% of producers in Latin America and the Caribbean that we are talking about. Unless we help them, we're going to get thousands, hundreds of million people falling below the poverty line. So we need those productive projects. Finally, we need to develop platforms, as already mentioned. We have Mano de la Mano, a platform with over 60 countries on board, uh, Honduras being one of them. And through the data we have and the global data, as well as based on, on science-based experiences, the idea is to channel investments with guarantees that strengthen the prospects for countries. And digitalization is vital. Without that, we will not be able to do it. And yesterday, we actually talked about this with the president of the IDB. I think the time has come where all ideas need to be truly tangible and concrete. Time is short. We need quick results. That's the demand of society. And I think we can do it. Thanks, Mario. Tackling the challenges faced by smallholder farmers, um, when it comes to poverty, we must work on that, especially rural poverty and smallholder farmers through more efficient methods can increase the production and carrying on with trade. Like, uh, like Belize, agricultural production volumes are small, but the issues and concepts related to food security and food insecurity are not necessarily that different from those of uh, larger countries. Can you please explain what is the regulatory framework that, you, that your government has in place in terms of trade? Uh, in terms of investments to facilitate uh, agricultural production? You were mentioning some of them uh, in the, your previous intervention, but maybe you can get into more detail. Uh, thank you. 75% um, <clears throat> of the agriculture producers in Belize are smallholders, so that's where we, we start from. And so um, it's important for us to, to look at their needs, to see how we can support their, their interests and their needs in terms of their agriculture production. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing right now in Belize is especially the smallholder farmers being on the borderline of poverty. We need to ensure that they don't fall below the poverty line, as our colleague from the FAO is saying. And one way we're, one way we're doing that is we're taking our approach to climate adaptation and taking advantage of it and using it as a way to build the capacity of small farmers. Um, uh, this is either through just capacity building, training, equipment, new technologies, 
um, in order for them to be able to feed themselves, but also to produce surplus for the local economy and the local market. Um, we also have a very broad push for the rebuilding of cooperatives in the country. Um, you know, cooperatives have been something that have worked in the past, but for some reason have been forgotten. And so it provides a, a structure for small farmers to become involved in, in production and become involved and participate in the economic life of the country, especially those from rural areas. And so without structure, without a platform to participate, this is how they get left behind. And so we see that the cooperative system is a very a, important system. It holds a lot of potential for small farmers to become involved and to participate. And we use this as a channel to, to bring further support to them as, as we're doing now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at uh, providing incentives for small producers in order for them to, to grow their agriculture production, uh, looking at all the inputs that they need for their farms, um, including technologies. But this includes um, a climate smart agriculture in interventions, a expanding irrigation, uh, expanding greenhouses, greenhouse uh, structures or cover structures as we call them. Um, and in this way, uh, help the small farmers to, to become much more um, productive. But overall, what, what we're doing is looking at the, the picture of rural life, of livelihoods, of agricultural production, and seeing what challenges they face, and working together with them what we, one by one, we're moving those challenges out of the way in order for them to have the opportunity that they need to feed themselves, to feed their families, to earn an income, and to contribute to the growth of the economy. But it all starts with the government being very responsive to the needs of the communities in rural areas, responsive to the needs of the private sector, ensure that you move quickly and pragmatically to address policy hurdles, um, and not wait for years, as our colleague from FAO says, we need actions that produce results now, because that's what the people demand and that's what, what we're doing. As you will see, again and again, the issue of smallholder farmers keeps coming up. And the Vice Minister has also addressed an important matter in terms of how smallholders associate themselves uh, through cooperativism. And here we have an example as to how an agricultural cooperative can work well. Your cooperative brings together thousands of smallholder farmers and micro farmers. So through that, how have you contributed to more sustainable food production? Thanks, Aitor. Our cooperative is today marking 59 years right on this day. So the way we see it, cooperativism, is the best way to bring together and create synergies to enhance jobs, income, and sustainability for smallholders. We currently have 13,000 members in our cooperatives, many of whom are smallholder farmers, but teamed up in the cooperative, smallholder farmers can buy high quality inputs at competitive prices because, as someone mentioned earlier, the greater quantities lead to better prices for our cooperative members. So our cooperative takes care of all of that process. Once the inputs have been purchased, the supplies have been purchased, we process the production of the cooperative members by adding value to the primary production, whether it be soya, 
maize, uh, transforming the production when it comes to uh, chicken and also to pork. So meat that is to be exported to over 175 countries. And we have a presence in all states of our federation and also in some countries as uh, already mentioned here in the Americas. We provide technical assistance, which is a key point because smallholders don't have all of the technical conditions and knowledge to do the sowing and to uh, conduct their activities in the best possible way. So we provide technical assistance, a good deal of training. We also provide support for our cooperative members all along the production change right from the time of sowing. Uh, and um, also when it comes to um, breeding the animals like chicken and uh, chickens and pigs. So we work quite intensively with our members, with our cooperative members, and sustainability is at the heart of our mission. The importance of cooperativism is the social value besides the um, economic value. Our mission is to bring our members to a better economic and financial condition through social work, working on the sustainability front so that all of our processes are taken uh, stock of um, in terms of the CO2 impact. We're also working a lot on regenerative agriculture and biological inputs. So all of these actions we believe are conducive when the smallholder farmers come together within the cooperative and all of that is crucial to improve conditions and also to alleviate poverty and hunger. Thank you. Claudio Rosario, in your previous statement, you talked about uh, the empowerment of women for greater productivity within your company. But smallholder farmers are also key for Dumper. And uh, it's interesting to, to see how you work with them. Could you tell us about the kinds of initiatives your company has for smallholders? When we co-funded Dumper 29 years ago, we didn't have a single uh, hectare of our own. So our initial um, vertical integration was zero. However, it was crucial for us to secure the trust of small holders. And Ever since then, we started to bring on board smallholders as part of our value chain by providing knowledge, technology, and also helping them gain access to fertilizers, seeds, and high quality plantlets. In that way, for 29 years now, we have been helping incorporate smallholders into the global food value change. I think there's no way to ensure the sustainability of our value chain with a view to the food security our countries and the planet require, other than by being able to develop our smallholder farmers in a structural and systematic fashion. This is why at a company, we have been working with smallholders in order for them to be able to raise their productivity, expand their agricultural border, diversify the products, and thereby get them to overcome the trap of subsistence agriculture, thereby also improving their quality of life. 
we can see that a significant percentage of the most vulnerable population segment depends on family-based agriculture uh, precisely. It's a paradox, but smallholders in our countries who contribute to our own food security are the ones that lack food security because they are part of the most vulnerable population. This is why we must include smallholders in the supply chains, both local and global, through quality and competitive prices. In this way, we will manage to get smallholders to bolster their capacities and skills. A damper, hand in hand with our smallholders, we've been able to conquer the main artichoke market, which is the United States. We supply 70 percent. Uh, we we uh, supply 70 percent of the supermarkets in the U.S. And this we do side by side with our smallholders, uh, offering training to them on an ongoing basis. And uh, we support them throughout the whole process, and we help them perform the control at each of the critical points in the operation so as to ensure compliance with the highest standards of quality. And in that way, they can contribute to the food security of their own families as they generate income based on their productivity. And in that way, they contribute to world food security. And the other point I'd like to add has to do with the fundamental importance of working with smallholder farmers because as they improve their quality of life, we achieve an impact in terms of a healthy and socially peaceful environment, which is vital in order to create sustainability in our ecosystem. And in that way, we can strengthen our contribution to the sustainable development of our countries and also enhance our contribution to global food security. Thanks, Rosario. And uh, Fatima, we've been hearing about sustainability, but in a more oblique sort of way. Um, actually, FME is CMI is a company that seriously uh, takes the issue of uh, environmental and social sustainability, both in production and throughout the whole uh, supply and production change. What are the experiences that CMI is driving in terms of sustainability and food security? Thank you, Aitor. Before getting into the concrete experience, let me share a thought. To us, sustainability is the business strategy. It is not something that we do as a side dish or romantic thing. This is at the core of our business strategy, and that's how we live. Our goal is to feed the world, to provide well-being. And if we are betting on food security, we don't lose sight of the required sustainability. And I can share three concrete experiences. And part of our success, I think, at the end of the day has had to do with the fact that we had a focus and clear priorities. On the climate change front, our most tangible experience has to do with the fact that in the last eight years, we've been able to reduce uh, over 110,000 tons of CO2 through two super simple initiatives. The first one being innovation in the uh, feed for our avian chain. Part of our business focus on that. We have spectacularly innovated uh, in our feeding processes, which improves the digestion of uh, chickens. And this has an impact in terms of CO2 all through so, uh, solar panels, which also has a positive impact on CO2 emissions and has a positive business impact. And the third point, which I'm passionate about, and after here in Rosario, I think we are very much on the same wavelength and share that. We, we need to believe in and strengthen our value chain. There's no such thing as individual success. An individual business will not grow alone unless the chain is empowered. We have a uh, 
chicken-related uh, business called the Casa del Rey. Some may see it just as a chicken business, but we see it as a point of empowerment through partnerships like the one we have with you uh, at IDB Invest. We offer technical and financial training to women who have this point of sale. Um, they sell chicken within vulnerable communities, but they have the technical skill. They get training on financial marketing and sales and also with a focus on resilience so that women who also need to take care of the families, they often support their families, they are integrated into the production structure of their country. And the last experience I'd like to share is how we are betting on nutrition. I think that in addition to offering quality products to all that are accessible and affordable to all, we also offer products that help tackle one of the key challenges we have in Central America, malnutrition or undernutrition. And we have our social arm, um, the Juan Bautista Gutierrez Foundation. We have a beautiful project as part of which we offer uh, nutrition through the NutriBM product, which is supported by the World Food Program with all of the data requirements to uh, fight malnutrition and poor nutrition. And it's a beautiful uh, job offering um, proper food and nutrition to communities, especially with the focus on the early years of children so that those children may grow healthy and be part of the production structure in the future. So clear examples of the uh, options to fight food insecurity by working sustainably both on the social and environmental fronts. Mr. Um, Suazo, you talked about this in your first statement. Both the private and public sectors need to work together. Other panelists have also highlighted this. But in Honduras, there are examples as to how both sectors work together. Could you perhaps uh, highlight some examples of this? Yes. Look. Um, after all I've heard here by way of the response to food insecurity, let me tell you that at the Secretary of Agriculture of Honduras, we have a motto, United by Agro. And I see again here that all of these experiences require bringing together partnerships with integration. And of course, many examples could be given. But First, let me say that there's a global need to recognize the value of the work done by agricultural workers and, and farmers, men, women, and youth in the rural context. It's physical work, but it is work that is not duly recognized. This morning, I had a bottle of water at a hotel, and it was $10.50, just a liter of water. I started doing the maths in my mind right away, and I said, my goodness, 10.50 represents 20 liters of milk. If I were to, you know, fresh milk straight from the producers. Only a week ago, promoting an agricultural fair uh, strategy at uh, municipalities, and villages, this would have been 80 carrots, 15 pounds of uh, beans. And it's not that the water doesn't have the value. There's the packaging, the brand, and so on. But it also makes me think about what we need to do to learn to integrate with uh, private businesses, especially on the marketing side, to add the needed value to generate higher income. I think. I will leave the question at this. There's a whole lot of experiences, especially as regards the international cooperation sector. That is a key actor that we haven't touched upon. There's a whole amount, millions and millions of dollars that have been invested in our countries, including my own, sorry. But I think when you look at the partnerships, the most important thing is for us to be clear in our minds as to what agreements and contracts we enter into with private business and uh, through international cooperation and how the results will help looking at the indicators. In my own case, my main responsibility is to ensure production. Fortunately, 
we have a president, the first woman president in the country, but she's also uh, a farmer. So she firmly believes in the need for changes in agriculture to alleviate poverty. So I think those partnerships with private business can be mutually beneficial. So labor, work, and products for sale. But in exchange for that, we want good prices for farmers so that we can all eat well, but also to create seed capital in the pockets of all farmers so that tomorrow they won't depend on handouts, on social bonds, so that they can make their own decisions and say, I'm going to invest in this. So my conclusion has to do with the great importance of partnerships at all levels, and we all need each other. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we conclude this panel. I hope you have enjoyed the uh, top-notch uh, presentations, and it's clear that the private and public sectors work together and will continue to do so to fight food insecurity. Thank you very much, and thanks to our panelists. Um, thanks very much to our experts, uh, speakers, and of course, uh, thanks to our moderator as well. We will now carry on with our agenda related to the um, second panel as part of our seminar with a focus on the green energy transition in Latin America and the Caribbean. To kick off the conversation, it is my honor to welcome Ricardo Mourinho, Vice President of the European Investment Bank. A big round of applause for him, please. Good morning. Dear friends, good morning and thank you for being here. I would like to thank the Inter-American Development Bank with whom we work side by side in the region. Thank you for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. In a precedented situa situation in recent history, high and volatile energy prices coupled with disruptions in commodity and food markets are hurting our economies and our lives. The war is weighing on our economies, not only in Europe, but across the world globe. The combination of high energy prices high inflation, the reappraisal of risk by market participants, and the extraordinary uncertainty are putting a damper on growth. And still, we need to stay in the course on decarbonization. This is why the discussion today in this session cannot be more timely and necessary. This is a global priority that became last year an emergency. And this is why accelerating the green transition at the global scale is now the main priority. Our activity and our goal to support 1 trillion euros in green investments by 2030, the, global, the European Investment Bank will make a crucial contribution to the global decarbonization of our economies and to energy security. We invest with a firm conviction that only research and investment in innovative clean technologies can lift productivity and lead to a more robust and sustainable growth. And our response must be global, because the challenge we face is a global one. Greenhouse gas emissions and hurricanes and droughts do not respect any national borders. It's a global change. It's a global challenge that requires a global action on climate change. European Investment Bank and the EIB Global, our development branch, bears on our operations outside the European Union, with a structure designed to foster strong and focused partnerships across the globe. EIB Global leverages on our long experience in more than 150 countries to provide advice on project planning, structuring and implementation and crowding in financial flows from the private sector into great investments. 
As part of Team Europe, the European Investment Bank is the key partner for the implementation of the European Global Gateway Strategy, a strategy that stands for sustainable and trusted connections that work for people and for the planet. Investing in mitigation and climate resilience, as well as in clean energy, is a necessity, but is also a major economic opportunity for low- and middle-income countries. The green transition is creating new opportunities across different sectors, and we need to grab these opportunities. The IB is using its resources to finance clean investments, building on our capacity to react also to the current energy crisis. We are not starting from scratch. When it comes to renewables and to energy efficiency, we have a track record. We have also a track record in Latin America and in the Caribbean region. The energy transition can be and should be accelerated. The EIB is committed to deliver inside and outside the European Union borders. Last year, EIB Global provided finance of almost $1.8 billion in projects across this region, of which 75% contributed directly to climate action and environmental sustainability in Latin America and the Caribbean. This means <coughs> that three out of four dollars were devoted to finance the green transition, to finance climate action, and to finance environmental sustainability. These figures built on the work deployed in the past years. EIB has had a, real, a leading role in energy transition for long. We are financing more than $2 billion for renewable energy operations in Latin America and the Caribbean since 2018, with significant presence in Brazil, or through the intermediated st structures in regional facilities in, in Argentina, in Mexico, in Peru, and across all Latin America. This translates into an additional capacity install of close to 6,000 megawatts and more than 1,600 kilometers of interconnections and upgraded grids. To achieve carbon neutral by middle of the century, as envisaged in the Paris Agreement, we must cut sharply our emissions now. Green hydrogen is seen by many as the key to achieve these goals. The 25 million euros Green Hydrogen Fund established with the German Ministry of Economy and, the, and Climate Action is currently being prepared by the European Investment Bank and by the GIZ. A trust fund global in scope and intended to support project preparation for future investments. GIZ supported Chile to adopt a national green hydrogen strategy and make plans potentially to produce green hydrogen for its own use and for export. And the IB is ready to support. Progress so far in some areas like improving energy efficiency has been impressive, and much more can be done in others, like recycling and reusing to conserve the use of critical raw materials, like advancing on new technologies and digitalization, because we believe that the green and digital transition reinforce each other. The digital transition supports the green transition with developments and technologies that contribute to achieving the target of climate neutrality by 2050. Innovation in the 21st century is digital. Digital is an enabling technology, and only digitalized firms will benefit from the cutting edge innovation that is developing by the hour. The dissemination of cutting-edge green innovation requires digital companies, digital governments, and most and above all, digital societies. Let me conclude. The transition to a carbon-neutral economy will be accompanied by socioeconomic impacts for the global workforce. And we aim to support countries. We aim to support economies who are heavily dependent on fossil fuels through the decarbonization of industries and the creation of new economic opportunities for all. Without a strong focus on a just transition, we will not succeed in the fight against climate change. Most likely, we are witnessing the largest transfer of wealth at the global scale we will see in our lives. <coughs> there cannot be all winning winners and ever losing losers. If the transition is not fair, it will never happen. Just transition is a core concern for the European Investment Bank. 
sorry. We committed in the COP26 to a just transition that supports countries and people to move towards net zero emission economies. But we do more. We are increasing our financing for projects that enhance the resilience of people and areas most vulnerable to the already materializing impacts of climate change. We are committed to working with the European Commission, with the governments, with our fellow IFIs and the private sector to support a green transition that leaves no one behind. We are prepared to do our part with innovative financing tools, crowding in private finance as well, as technical assistance and advisory services to our clients. Thank you very much, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Ahora tenemos. Thank you so much. Now it's an honor for us to welcome a panel of experts who will speak about both the public and private sector. Our moderator is Hema Sacristan, who is a business leader with IDB Invest. I'm sure this, you will find this a very interesting panel because it will help us to better understand the transition to renewable and sustainable energy sources in the region. Let's welcome our panelists with a round of applause. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you to speak about the transition to green energy in Latin America and the Caribbean. As we know, it's a very important subject, not just for the region, but for the world because of its impact on our economies and on the environment. Clean and accessible energy is essential for competitiveness and innovation in various sectors of the economy. And also, it is important to reduce fiscal pressures and to provide for environmental sustainability. Fortunately, a number of countries in the region are making significant strides in changing their energy matrix to incorporate clean energy. Between 2015 and 2020, the region stepped up its renewable capacity by 33 percent. And yet, according to estimates, from the IDB, we know there's still much to be done because we expect to see an increase in the need for energy in the coming years. In 2020 to 2030, we estimate that 50 percent, or actually 48 percent to be exact, that is going to be the size of the increase. So it's important to see how we are going to finance all the needed investments. In recent years, as I said, we have seen how renewable energies have become available, and they have had a very positive impact. There's been a reduction in the cost of energy and also a reduction in dependence on fossil fuels, and also a reduction when it comes to the region of uh, the country's dependence on oil-producing countries. But it's important to offset climate change effects and achieve a net zero level for 2030. We believe that to do this, public-private collaboration is extremely important so that we can execute all the investments and actions that are going to be needed. This panel is going to be discussing this, so I'm very pleased to have leading experts from around the world. I'd like to introduce each one of them to you first. Ligia Castro, who is an advisor with the Ministry of the Environment of Panama. She's a climate change advisor. Fernandez So, director for Latin America and the Caribbean for the European Commission. Evia Ganaun from the Brazilian Association of Wind Energy. Alberto Torres, who leads the public sector group for LATAM at Citibank. And lastly, Olivier Masson, who is the CEO of Atome Energy. So I'd like to start, if I may, with a question for Ligia. From your point of view, 
Why is it important to consider climate change scenarios when it comes to decision making and planning at the national level as countries strive to achieve that energy transition in the region? It's extremely important. Panama actually has just updated its climate change scenarios. And what this does is it prepares us to start working on the plan for the adaptation of the energy sector. We have 90% of our matrix is clean. That's in the dry season, or in the rainy season. At the end of the dry season, it drops to 70. And if we have an El Nino, then that number goes down to 60. In addition, climate change scenarios show us that the two provinces where we find the main hydroelectric plants, Bocas del Toro and Chiriqui, by 2030, 2050, and 2070, are going to see a reduction in rainfall. It's going to be gradual, but there's also going to be a rise in temperatures during the day. So this means that not only are we going to lose lake resources as a result of a reduction in rainfall, but there's also going to be more evaporation as temperatures rise. So we can imagine investing in photovoltaic technology using batteries at this level so that we can achieve a combination of hydro and photovoltaic energy sources during a drought or when there is a peak demand in the system. But another thing that is necessary is to have more resilient infrastructure for generation, distribution, and transmission during the summer. We also have to consider wildfires in different areas, forest and among others, because these have an impact on our facilities and also affect the energy supply available for the population. So we do need to consider climate change scenarios. Great, thank you. Jose Miguel, from the standpoint of a development agency, specifically Corfo in Chile, what are the opportunities for collaboration with governments and public agencies so that we can truly drive that green transition, which is greatly needed? Thank you very much. Rather than an opportunity, Chile sees this as an obligation. What does this mean? It means that what we need in the process is a shared vision, a strategic view so that the rules that are put in place come about as a result of a just process, understanding that there will be both cost and benefits. So it's important to look at the trade-offs and balance the two so that everyone benefits. The way you achieve this is through a dialogue and also through participation that is a challenge Chile is grappling with, especially during these early stages. This is an opportunity for innovation, for technology development, and for entrepreneurship. And these are elements that emerge from the process. Then there's also the subject of SMEs and startups, which is an area the bank has supported significantly. And then lastly, I would also say that international agreements are important. For example, in the case of hydrogen, we are quite involved in this technology. It is fairly well known. So technology transfer and transferring best practices to local companies is important and can be achieved through such agreements. And it's a win-win for both parties. As a re result of these transfer agreements, we are able to trade carbon bonds. So these are another measures we can use to achieve a reduction. So to answer your question, more than an opportunity, we see this as an obligation, and we are working on this in Chile. Yes, achieving a just transition, leaving no one behind, is extremely important. Let's turn to the private sector and speak to Alberto, who represents Citibank. I'd like to ask you, what are the trends you see in green finance? And what innovative instruments 
are in place and will be more widely used to finance all of these opportunities, in your opinion. I would say that the issue with climate and greed finance is that there has to be a global solution. It is a positive externality, as it is called by economists, so it's improving a public good at the global level, so any collaboration with countries or institutions striving to improve climate has benefits for everyone, not just for those who are involved. So I think it is important to look at the debt for nature instruments specifically. What these mean is that a country or institution pledges to undertake a activity that benefits climate and they pay for that investment but it is in fact subsidized because it offers more accessible pricing to the international community. So this concept is aimed at solving the problem of coordination. Then there's something else I would like to mention which may come up a bit later and it's to what extent can we have a development approach when it comes to climate without considering how this has to come hand in hand with other elements that have been mentioned here, especially things that need to happen in our countries on the social front. While well, Europe is the region which is leading the agenda, the world agenda when it comes to some of these things, so we'll turn to Felix and ask him how does Europe see Latin America and what do you think we should be doing in order to do more in this context? Thank you. Good morning to everyone. To say that Europe has the lead when you look at the renewables mix in Europe and then you look at Latin America and the Caribbean I think is a bit presumptuous. But what we can say is that we are very aware and we are preparing the summit for a the European Union and Latin America and the Caribbean, which is going to take place in June, because it's going to be important to look at two priorities on which our regions are completely aligned, and that is the need for a green and digital transition, which is just. We're all aiming for that. We don't know exactly where it lies. We each have our solutions and our mixes, but it is our common objective. And why? Because we have all signed the Paris Agreement, because we are convinced that it is important for us to take joint international action in order to drive the energy transition as one of the key ways to fight climate change. But to that end, it is very important, and that is what Europe is working on with new ideas, is to do what was done in Europe with the next generation funds. We want to push for public financing and public policy objectives to see how we can foster that transition. That means having both public financing, private investment, and as was said before, not leaving anyone behind see how we can have the last mile connectivity that or last kilometer which is going further than the last mile and to do that we also need to transfer technology technology is important when it comes to renewables and when it comes to green hydrogen which is one of the other elements we all seek what this means is having a shared value chain and I think we should mention that because as we have a shared value chain, we also provide social added value, and we'll discuss that further later, but we're also talking about technology transfer and new solutions, and that must have to come in tandem with vehicles like green bonds. We're working on this initiative to improve the green bonds market and Latin America is where we find most enthusiasm for this but there's also regulation training and last kilometer initiatives which are key Europe is ahead when it comes to raising awareness we are asking everyone to use stairs not elevators but that means that we all need to do this together it's very interesting, the need for raising awareness, and also I think it's important that Europe has 
a joint institutional agenda, which it is working on and connecting with other parts of the world, and that is what offers us an opportunity to work together. Let's now go to the private sector. We have heard from public sector and bank. I'd like to go to the private sector now. With Olivier from Atom Energy, I'd like to ask you what you are doing and where do you see the change? Where do you see the more sustainable renewables globally and also in Latin America? First of all, thank you for allowing me to speak English because I need to work more on my, on my Spanish. It is the first company focused on the production of green hydrogen and green ammonia listed on the London Stock Exchange. First one we created three years ago and we are still the only one. Um, why green hydrogen, green ammonia? It's about decarbonizing three sectors, power, industry and agriculture. Um, we know that the hydrogen economy is in infancy, but with green hydrogen, you can create green ammonia, and with green ammonia, you can indeed go after the fertilizer sector. So from a decarbonization point of view, you heard earlier today, the agricultural sector has really suffered from what happened into the war in Ukraine. 30% of all ammonia fertilizers come from Russia. Right? So it's about if we can not only produce things locally, our first projects, is in Paraguay. We just announced that we are going to open a project in a JV in Costa Rica. We are also looking in Iceland for decarbonizing shipping. Uh, for us, it's really about developing sensibly sized projects which have a market and a local market impact. This is how you can go faster and have a bigger impact because ammonia, 50% of the world's fertilizer is derived from ammonia, is 2% of the world's emissions today. So we need to decarbonize the existing, and we need to decarbonize also the future, because we're in a world which adds 10, uh, 10, 1 billion people every 10 years. So you heard earlier from, uh, um, sorry, from, uh, from Irene and James, there's a lot of capital, but there's not that many projects on the other side. And I was with the IFC for 10 years, and I decided to go on the project side and create these projects. But these are markets which has to mix the utility sector and the chemical agri sector. So in a sense, we are helping create the market. So that's how Atom was created. And that's really the role we want to do is to produce domestic uh, ammonia, which obviously we can grow and start exporting, but really first starting having a local impact. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias. Um, Thank you. We're now going to go to technologies, both current and future, which we know are going to play a key role in this energy transition. I'd like to give the floor to Elvia, who will be telling us about the potential of wind energy and the role she thinks it's going to be playing in the future in the green transition. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. There's something very interesting about Brazil when we speak about natural resources for energy production. Like Panama, in 2022, we produced 92% of our energy from renewable sources. Over the past 10 years, we adjusted our energy matrix, introducing wind energy and more recently, solar energy we have sizable renewable resources which are competitive in Brazil. Now we are starting to look into regulation in order to implement offshore wind energy and also to produce green hydrogen. There's much potential and we are somewhat concerned about Brazil's current image or current situation. It seems that there is no market for us. Our problem is that we have many projects and our economic growth does not suffice for us to carry out projects to produce all the energy we need. The Brazilian economy does have the opportunity to grow and develop based on energy now with a new administration and we have new market growth prospects and are planning 
to look into public policy mechanisms, regulation for offshore wind energy and also for green hydrogen. We need to find financing mechanisms for onshore wind energy and solar projects. As I said, the technologies are already quite competitive and abundant. But our macroeconomic situation is not very favorable. Interest rates and taxes are quite high. Investors are being driven to other markets precisely because there is no medium or long-term security when it comes to pricing. And also, there are questions about Brazil's capacity to absorb all the required investments. Consequently, we need to find new markets. With new markets, and by changing our energy matrix, by going to sources that are not electric. We in our industry is still using natural gas and coal. So on the Brazilian market, we believe there are opportunities to s generate an energy shift by changing our productive processes. So that is one potential market. And I think there's also much potential when it comes to producing green energy for import purposes in seven to nine years, and that could be another opportunity for Brazil. But right now, we need to find sources of financing, and that is tough right now because of our macroeconomic situation. Well, lately, we've heard much about green hydrogen it tends to come up in any conversation about new technologies and opportunities. And Latin America is making an effort in this area. The IDB group is working with 15 countries, countries which are including that technology in their transition plans. IDB Invest is looking for ways to finance those initial projects. Olivier and his company are pioneers, clearly. They have some projects, one in Paraguay, one in Costa Rica, as he said. And it would be interesting, Olivier, if you could tell us what it means to be a first mover in this industry. How do you approach the challenge of being a first mover? And how do you address project-based risk? You not only are you doing it, but you need to attract other investors to join in. Which is we have a lot of green infrastructure investors who are used to do another wind project, you know, another <laughs> solar project. This is very different. This is not utilities. This is what we used to be 15 years ago in renewable energy. So you are creating a new market. The hydrogen economy itself is quite particular where 70% of the cost of a project is the cost of power, no matter what you look at it. Then you have to have demand on the other side, and you have to make sure that you are not too far from your demand so that you reduce all of the risks on risks and being able to present something bankable to investors. The last point is we talk about green ammonia, green hydrogen, this is great, but these are markets which do not have a value yet. Everybody says, I want to buy green hydrogen, I want to buy green fertilizer, but they will pay the price for gray fertilizer. Right, that market is being created as we speak. So, when what did we look at? So, for us, you know, clearly, Latin America has one of the largest potential for renewable energy, and as you heard, Brazil is a massive potential. Um, so, for us, we looked first and foremost. Our first project should be in the place where you have the most excess power and the largest demand. Paraguay, largest exporter of green electricity in the world today one of the largest exporter of soya bean, part of Mercosur, which is one of the largest uh, importer, or the world's largest importer of fertilizer. So if you can produce locally, displace imports, you would have a natural cost advantage, which will allow you to reduce the need for any carbon subsidies, you know, some of these prices. It's all about speed to market. 
Um, and then regulation, right? For Paraguay, as the government was very clear, it told Ande, the national utility, you have to play a role into the decarbonization of the country. Mm -hmm. you know, it's great to have a 100% green grid and all of your electrons are green, but what can you do to upgrade these electrons into green molecules, create a new economy? So you have supply, demand, existing infrastructure, and an enabling environment from the government, which allows you to do things at cost, competitively, and very importantly, fast. Right. Today, we've seen interest rate rise. Every year you lose, as an investor, it's another 10% you lose. So it all comes into bankability. So these are really what we are looking for. Right? It's really supply, demand, regulation, speed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We are very pleased to be by your side in Paraguay, and we hope the project will be a true success. And Staying with new technologies, I would like Elvia to tell us a bit about how you're integrating all of these technologies as part of such a large country as Brazil is. Yes, we had a very interesting experience through the introduction of new technologies such as onshore wind power and more recently sun power. The basis for the introduction of new technologies is a strong government stand. You know, it's the positioning that doesn't have to do necessarily with making money available. There's no public funding for these investments in Brazil. But you need a strong positioning in terms of signaling the path for development. And now with the uh, new administration, of course, things have changed. Uh, for four years, we had difficulties uh, to talk about uh, climate change or the energy transition. But the new administration is truly open to talk about these matters. And also, this administration understands that infrastructure in the energy sector is a major variable and component for development. So we are currently talking to the government and coming up with a proposal for investments to be made in green hydrogen and also um, for offshore wind power. First off, you need to have the regulatory framework so that there's certainty and security for investments, but you also need to clearly signal where the demand will be. We've got the supply, we've got to investors that have the money to invest in Brazil, but we need to have the regulatory basis as well as the long-term signals to the fact that there will be demand for this kind of energy as at the moment, there is a lot of highly competitive renewable energy. There's a surplus, so to speak, and uh, in the short term, it wouldn't make much sense to make uh, new investments. But we know that when it comes to infrastructure, it's about long-term business. So that's the point we need to convey and pursue a strong positioning through public policies so that these investments actually materialize. And they are being made, but there's, there's a much stronger potential there than what we get to see now. Great. Ligia, let's get back to the Panamanian, to the local market. Let's talk about the features of the transition. Reference has been made to the just transition. And for a sustainable and inclusive um, transition, we have to take into account several dimensions. For example, the interesting projects regarding the circular economy. What are its implications and what are you getting to see in Panama? 
In terms of the circular economy, which is one of the 10 nationally determined contributions, as in the case of energy, we have placed great emphasis not only on energy efficiency, but above all to reducing the carbon footprint. The corporate and municipal project-related, service-related municipal carbon footprints. Two years into the program for carbon footprint reduction, we have 158 corporations. One of them, the Panama Canal Authority, has a carbon neutrality commitment by 2030. And uh, there's another uh, set of corporations that have a uh, carbon neutrality deadline for 2030 as well. Our emissions have um, got to do with the electromobility side as well, because the transition to electromobility will make a huge difference when it comes to reducing the uh, carbon footprint. Uh, well, to preach by uh, or lead by example, the Ministry of the Environment actually conducted a uh, tender, the award took place yesterday, and there will be solar panels actually on the building of the Ministry of the Environment, not just in the parking lot, and there will be charging stations as well, and the f uh, first five electro vehicles will be purchased in the first uh, phase, which will span six months, and every six months will continue to renew the fleet to move towards an electric uh, vehicle fleet. But uh, this is something that the local banks are also engaged in. There are 11 banks involved in the Reduce Your Footprint program, and there are programs available so that the priority projects will be those that seek to reduce the carbon footprint for a project, for services, for products. We are very much boosting the carbon footprint reduction process for products. So we are going well beyond energy efficiency as such and hope to be able to bolster this process. And uh, the award will uh, be delivered in April. There's an award consisting of a prize uh, that is a trophy, a cup uh, made through plastic recycling, and the recognition or the, uh, the award is uh, inscribed on the uh, trophy itself so that you don't use more plastic than is needed or more material than is needed. And uh, next year, we'll launch a new process. And the uh, Tokumen Airport, along with other airports within its jurisdiction, they have confirmed that they will join the carbon footprint reduction program. And we are also working to have airlines on board so as to expand to all economic sectors the carbon footprint reduction process, which also has an impact on the flagship um, fleet of uh, ships of Panama. The idea being to put in place the incentives so the most efficient uh, vessels going through the canal will also enjoy incentives. And there's also the green hydrogen hub, which is about to be um, implemented in Panama. This is spearheaded by the Secretary of Energy, and that will also play a key role in order to make more efficient and um, cleaner the uh, vessels traffic in Panama. Um, and a while ago, for Chile and um, Corfo, Jose Miguel, you were say, saying that there was a need and commitment. I think that's a highly inspiring vision. But how do you balance, or how do you think you need to balance international competitiveness, since there are so many actors that want to position themselves with regard to these agendas, and especially some technologies, like we've seen in the case of green hydrogen. So how do you basically balance that uh, global competition 
with the need for a just transition that will create local jobs, because obviously it is important not to leave anyone out. How do you go about that in Chile? Well, on the uh, understanding that what underlies this is not about energy policy or production policy only. It's about both things. Chile has a great advantage when it comes to green energies, both solar in the north and wind power in the south. So uh, we can actually export that and uh, the byproducts, which makes us internationally competitive. Now, it is quite a large pie. The challenge is so huge. Instead of uh, the gigawatts uh, that we are looking at, we'll be perhaps producing 30. We are talking about a smaller capacity. But uh, we are competitive in spite of the distance involved. But this is an opportunity for um, productive transformation for Chile. The green strategy relies on three pillars. One is support for foreign investment to develop green energy and its byproducts, but also there's a focus on related productive opportunities. If we are going to install 5,000 generators in Chile, of course, uh, you can't imagine uh, 5,000 um, be sailing across the world, on the seas of the world. So why not produce parts of that in Chile? And we have sectors like mining and the agri-industry that will have to transition towards green energy. And that requires knowledge and skills, some of which have already been developed in Europe or in other countries that can enable transfer mechanisms by leveraging local capacity. And there's also green bonds there's uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement as part of the picture. And the third pillar is export, the capacity you need in order to be able to export your products. We know that ammonia or e-fuels will be the main vehicles. So that gives rise to a need for public goods like ports and other infrastructure so that you can develop the, uh, the skills and the capacity. We see the challenge not only as an energy thing, but as an opportunity for productive transformation. The energy side of it, obviously, has to do with the advantages we have uh, at bottom with wind and uh, sun power. But there's also the local chains, the links, the transformation, and the generation of products and services that uh, are needed to develop these sectors, absolutely. So transforming business models is what it's about, and also it's about transforming uh, country models. There's a great opportunity there. Uh, Felix, now, carrying on with the same topic, how do we balance the social agenda and the green agenda? Well, the good thing and the interesting thing about traveling with Jose Miguel and his agency is that we agree. The bad thing is that I have to talk after him, so I no longer know what to say. What he said is what I was planning on saying. On the one hand, the energy transition will not be an energy transition unless it is inclusive, unless it has a social component, and unless all of society transitions towards a green energy model that can help sustain the planet. And for that, you need a lot of awareness raising. But it's also important for the energy transition to be beneficial. And although we all know there are many costs involved, we need to ensure that the costs are such that all social segments can consume neutrally and um, on a green basis. And that's what the European Union is supporting, not just private investment as such, but also productive investment, which uh, Jose Miguel talked about, as well as other panel members. And it's important for that investment to have a major component in terms of the public policy. It's not just about energy transition, but about social inclusion. And by changing the production model and by putting in place a joint chain value, which is another major priority of the EU in Latin America, the creation of joint value chains, in that way, you 
put in place more technologic investment, you create jobs, new markets, and you also generate more training opportunities and access by society to that sort of knowledge, which in turn fosters a social agenda. So it's not just about society as a whole having access to clean energy products, but it's also about ensuring that the chain value and uh, about integration and industrialization enabling access to jobs and also the right skills for the jobs of the future. Otherwise, it won't be possible. And that's what we want to insist on within the EU, access to financing both on the EU side and also as regards uh, businesses and countries in the uh, Latin American context in the context as well of public policies, knowing that we need a very high component of private investment in the energy transition, but with a focus on the social agenda, on coverage and inclusion. Yeah, that's clear. Alberto, from the perspective of a banker and of a large bank like Citibank, what is the role of the social agenda and of the just agenda leaving no one behind when it comes to structuring operations and structuring all of these projects? Well, it's a key role, and this is very important because when you think about the needs of countries to advance both agendas or a unified agenda, which is a just green agenda, you would think that there's resources of the uh, government or of the state that need to go into one thing or another. But when you put the social component in the conversation, it's really uh, zero sum. You allocate resources to either the social project or to this other activity that the government needs to take care of. It's not so easy. As in the case of the Green Agenda, where all of the community, the international community can participate, it's more of a win-win. So I think here, by aligning the social and green agendas, uh, clearly the private sector has to participate. Uh, the resources in the public sector are not enough to get the agenda truly going. And when it comes to uh, bankable instruments or alternatives, we in the public sector must change um, the paradigm. So it shouldn't be just about debt, debt structure and um, the, um, the integration. We need to think about the asset side, the concession, the uh, permits, the stable regulations that are based on a set of reasonable conditions. And you can create the conditions to monetize projects. And that's where the private sector can come in to ensure that some of the more easily monetizable green projects can release uh, some public resources that can go into the social component. And now, in wrapping up, would like to give two or three minutes to each panelist for them to tell us briefly, from their perspective, what concrete actions or measures would you recommend to accelerate the energy transition, whether public or private, depending on what your territory is? Licia, first. Well, the energy uh, transition needs to be accelerated by transforming the culture of the whole population. We need to work at the individual, family, community, business and government levels. Unless we transform the culture, we won't achieve the energy transformation, nor will we be just in the energy transition, as no one must be left behind. So empowerment, a climate empowerment strategy is needed so as to truly transform society, for it to transform the economy. That is fundamental. Excellent. Jose Miguel? I would say that one topic I think underlies this whole transformation process in the energy field has to do with the role of the public sector. And I mention this because of something Felix said. He emphasized the role of the public sector on the social front, which is very important, especially in light of the transformation of the mindset and the collective mindset. But there's also the productive dimension. In Chile, the state has more of an entrepreneurial role, not a business person, but it actually assumes risks 
at early stages of great uncertainty when you, for example, pioneer a sector where there's no created market yet. And that's important as a rather novel role, at least in Chile. And secondly, as a concrete measure, we need to understand that this is done on the ground. And our countries are actually very much used to a top-down uh, central, centralist and uh, presidentialist view. And you need to understand the yearnings, the, the uh, ambitions, the goals, and the fears that citizens have on the ground. And it's interesting, but sometimes you may think that fear has to do with conservation um, or when it comes to the generators, for instance. But when you, and of course you need the studies to license the projects, but when you ask citizens, this is something that's not really that close to them. What they care about is how dynamics will change on a day-to-day -day basis when Punta Arenas, the city of Punta Arenas, will uh, grow to twice its size when the plants are built. What will the impact be on the price of rent? What will be the impact on cities that have great quality of life? What will be the impact on the price of airfares? What will be the impact on the quality of life? So conducting a just transition also has to do with taking into account citizens who will be impacted but also will benefit through jobs as well. So that's what you need to understand, that this is something that you do in the field, for the territory, for the actual place, and we're not very much used in our countries, especially in the public sector, to work that way. And I think that's one second feature, and in Chile we are going in that direction. And thirdly, I, I, I would say that Chile has taken a more holistic state view in terms of this being a decarbonization goal by 2050. This is a collective process, and I think this is something that ensures consistency. So rather than each administration changing whatever the previous one has done, we continue to build systematically with a view to a long-term systematic impact. And one of the best ways to prevent the inconsistencies is having empowered citizens that understand that they will benefit in the long run, not just certain businesses or sectors or scientists or geographic regions, but society as a whole, which helps afford sustainability and consistency to um, a view that in the past used to be quite hard to achieve, at least in our countries. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Elvia, I do agree that we need a transformation in the uh, culture of societies, but you also need a transformation in the government culture. I think the private sector has advanced a little bit when you look at the mobilization of the financial markets uh, and you look at ESG. So I think the government also needs to have an approach and see energy as an instrument for development. Energy and infrastructure are instruments that can make the economy grow and help society develop. The countries of Latin America have the most precious asset, natural resources. We've got the potential, and we need to turn the potential into reality. We need for government to pursue that goal as a major instrument for economic, social, and environmental transformation. Very good. Thank you. Oliver? Three points. I'll start mm -hmm. macro, sector, and then finance. Mm -hmm. So number one, from a macro point of view, what we've learned from COVID and the war in Ukraine is that energy and food security has now hit home very hard for a number of countries, and it's become almost a competition. In the US, we have $700 billion toward the Inflation Reduction Act. In Europe, nearly 400 billion euros, which is there also to promote uh, green, uh, green energy, green hydrogen. In China alone last year, they developed 120 megawatts of green electricity, 120 gigawatts. Right? That's, mm. that's quite a number. 
And, and what we are seeing more and more is that they want to push investments at home. Right? And as a developer, we've been pushed to go towards the US, toward the, towards Europe, because they're all at that free money available. And that's really the danger here, is to become hostage again to importing green stuff, um, which obviously is not what we want. We want to create a new economy, be part of that new economy for development, for energy, for food independence. On a project point of view, right, we, with Vieta in Paraguay, 120 megawatt in operation by 2025 is going to be the largest in operation in Latin America before 2025. Um, we're talking about gigawatts, that's great. Right? We need to go to gigawatts, but today the largest green hydrogen to green ammonia project is 20 megawatt in Spain. So just to show that number one, we have to compete globally as a continent. Mm -hmm. on, so on top of that, we have to understand that there's a lot of promises around hydrogen, which there will be a lot of hard lessons learned. <laughs> and uh, I fully agree that you know, regulation needs to play a role but we cannot go for perfection because we're trying to figure out, okay, economy, climate, development, communities, it's all very important, but we have to accept there will be mistakes, right? And, you, and, and I am seeing in some countries' hydrogen strategies, they've, they are doing exactly what Europe did before in its um, green, uh, green subsidy schemes. It was looking for perfection. And it took the US IRA to push the EU to look again at its numbers and roll back because they were looking for perfection and it was preventing investment. The last point I will make is on finance. Right? When I talk to investors, when I talk to bankers, what do they want? They want an infinite equity support because it's a new industry. <laughs> they want a long-term offtake agreement when actually if you produce ammonia, if you sell ammonia, yes, I can have a 20-year offtake agreement, but they can only guarantee price for two years, not 20 years. They are looking for a management team who has done it before. Nobody has done what we are doing before. <laughs> and they are looking for technology which exists. It does exist, but it has never been done at that scale. Right? So we have to accept that new reality. And again, there are a lot of promises in this green stuff. But we are working in a very, very new sector. We are creating market. You know, and as you heard uh, from Gemma earlier, it's also one of the reasons that we are mandated with Bid Invest because we are creating this new market in this very, very challenging environment and in this very competitive uh, environment to make sure capital comes to Latin America. Mm -hmm. Stupendo. Great. Alberto. Thank you. Just three comments. I think first I'd say that in order to make progress, we need to bear in mind that progress has to be on two different channels. One seems to be somewhat more developed. Let's call it bottom-up, the private sector very much driving the green agenda through new techno technologies and innovative financing arrangements and governments uh, following a little bit further behind. But in Latin America, we need a parallel top-down sort of channel. We don't have a unified single narrative in the region. Each country has their own specificities. And generally speaking, I dare say that the role of multinationals, like, of course, the IDB group, due to its role in the region, can be instrumental in aligning the overarching major goals for the green transition while ensuring that it's just and sustainable. That's the first point. And for the second point, I'd go back to the dynamic inconsistency in regulation. One key role of governments is to set the rules of play with a long-term horizon. And this brings us to the natural gap between the uh, political and public policy horizons, which uh, is not always the same. So to what extent would a global overall narrative allow governments to have some external support to put in place some regulatory matters and, and rules of play with the long-term view. And the third point is that the cultural changes, as already noted, require a long time to be processed by the population. And that sort of processing time for the uh, population requires persistent messages we need unified metrics with a consistent follow-up over time. So as we develop a greater ability to have the green metrics, uh, you know, like 2030 and 2050, we already have some of that, 
we, we all understand the um, social improvement, but we still need to um, determine what are the best metrics. There are different measures when it comes to public uh, services, um, access, and other issues. I think the new multidimensional poverty indicators can afford more regularity when it comes to measuring the social dimensions. So at the end of the day, I think we need this global or regional message that will help governments have a medium to long-term planning horizon, and we need to monitor progress measurement on both fronts simultaneously. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Felix, uh, so as to wrap up, I think first I've um, read about a um, Euro European Union member state strategy for Latin America that um, suggests that the transition and the climate change um, strategy will change as long as Latin America wants that, because the European Union has made a decision, but it's up to Latin America, because this may, may sound a little bit too flowery, but uh, saving the world uh, has to do with staying on the energy transition path. As several of the panel members have said, resources and water, I think for, for the first time, Latin America and the Caribbean face a major opportunity in terms of strategic autonomy because the region has the resources to pilot this. What we need is some order in the picture, but the LAC region must take advantage of the opportunity for strategic autonomy in order to drive its energy transition and that of all others. I think this also requires, as we've all suggested, a major public-private collaboration approach because energy research and others are in the private sector. That's where the change is taking place. But at the same time, we need governments to make sure that the change will include everyone and will target not just profit, but the socialization and uh, full coverage. So this awareness raising and this uh, joint public and private sector work between government, business, multilaterals, financiers, securities exchanges, trades unions, in addition to citizen awareness, this is a challenge for all and that we must all seek to address. And this is what the EU is trying to pursue within the context of the July summit. We're trying to work with all parties concerned because we must all help ensure that the investments are productive and that they focus on the technologies and places where we want to go. Finally, raising awareness is something that affects us all. This is not exclusive to Latin America or Europe. I have heard, and I'll cite something. There's a place in La Mancha, which is a real place, but that I'd rather not remember. They said, since they built the windmills, it doesn't rain anymore. So that tells us that we need to work on social awareness raising. We need to try to stop being cold in the summer and warm in the winter. And uh, by the way, it's very cold in here. And that is not the way things should be. Thank you. Thank you to all panelists for giving us their views of the region's situation when it comes to the green energy transition. You have given us a full picture stressing the importance of public-private collaboration and also of civil society and what we as individuals can do so that we can play a role in this decision. I'll pick up on what Elvia said, one phrase. She said we should make sure that that transformation is not only something that is possible, that should become a reality. So we should all work together to provide our support from the IDB group. So again, I would ask you for a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you, thank you very much to our experts and especially to our moderator, Gema Sacristan, who is the general business uh, director for IDB Invest. 
We're going to pause now for networking and then come back to the next seminar, which is public-private collaboration and the gender and diversity agenda. We look forward to seeing you again. Bienvenidos a Panamá. I represent Finvera, which is the export credit agency of Finland. So always when Finnish companies are exporting to Latin America, we are happy to finance their buyers. Las expectativas es que podamos implementar los grandes movimientos que estamos teniendo en la región hacia la equidad, empezando por la salud. El impacto, además de positivo, es sustentable porque además va a lograr potenciar la marca país que no solamente lo quiere la autoridad de turismo, sino todos los entes privados.